I own Free Choice Enterprises. It's a mineral manufacturing firm. My background is in biochemistry, cell biology, immunology, bacteriology, and cows. And I'm going to start talking about grass and how it affects a cow, but you first need to know uh, how that grass grows, and then, the, then I'll talk about the effects. I, I probably have to take this mic with me. So I'm going to draw my grass plants here. I hope you can all see this. All right. And here's the sun. I draw an excellent sun. And the grass plant takes in carbon dioxide in through pores called stomata. Now, this is not an energy source. You put out fires with it, OK? Next, of course, the plant takes up water up into the plant. And water is not an energy source. You put out fires with it. But with photosynthesis, the from the sun, the sunlight through photosynthesis breaks this water molecule down, releases the oxygen into the air, and then combines the carbo carbon dioxide with the water to make a sugar or starch or fat or fiber, on and on. So <clears throat> the problem with this situation here is sometimes you have a cloudy day. So the amount of sugars, starches, fats that are produced by the plant are limited. Another limiting factor is if we don't have very much moisture, like we had this last year, we have a drought. We have a problem with making sugars. So <clears throat> I'm going to put up my sugar here. A sugar is just a carbohydrate or carbon hydrogen oxygen chain. Okay, carbohydrate. <clears throat> and that's what you're making is a bunch of simple sugars, which then will get complexed into making, into making uh, 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 fats, which will have more energy and less oxygen. Then you'll also make proteins and then cellulose and hemicellulose and on and on. So, <clears throat> so here we have this grass plant growing and we have, let's say, plenty of sun and plenty of moisture and, and so the energy is going to be uh, quite nice. Uh, but here's one of the things you've got to look for if you're grazing a cow on it. If you're grazing an animal, you have to worry about the the amount of energy compared to the amount of protein. If you have a diet that's excessive in protein, you'll end up with a thin cow that doesn't give much milk or meat. So you must graze the top part of the plant because that'll have the most energy. Because the energy of, from the sun doesn't come down here and go in down here. It hits in the top parts of the plant mostly. Okay, so if you analyze this, the energy content in this top third will be higher. Now this is important on people that are growing vegetables too. So if you're in the vegetable market and you're trying to sell a sweet uh, carrot or a, you know, a sweet apple, this amount of sunlight and this amount of moisture is very important to have them equal. Also, carbon dioxide is very important. Everybody's worried about cutting down the amount of carbon dioxide. If you calculate the amount of carbon dioxide out here in the country, away from Washington, D.C., or the big cities, you'll see we actually have a deficiency of carbon dioxide. 
So you could actually fertilize your pastures with carbon dioxide and increase the amount of grass production. Which, uh, so that means we can go to Washington DC and New York and Chicago and St. Louis and we can have those guys pay us to take their carbon dioxide and bring it out here and then we grow more vegetables and more grass and then sell them feedback and, and uh, we would get all the money and they could you know, do whatever they do probably give us more laws and screw everything up <laughs> <All right. coughs> so <coughs> no but this is true uh, this study on carbon dioxide was done in Germany by some plant uh, uh, plant uh, physiologist that we actually need to supplement I think in greenhouses they actually do this but if you're going to give carbon dioxide to the plant in a greenhouse, first off, make sure you don't walk in there when you're filling it up because you'll have a hard time breathing. The next thing you want to do is only do it during the day. This carbon dioxide is not going to get converted to sugars and starches and release oxygen unless you have sunlight. Okay? So, okay, so. Now, the next thing that occurs or can occur if you're grazing this plant and the reason I say graze the top third uh, not only for more energy but I want a great deal of this grass material not maybe a hundred percent but maybe seventy percent of it knocked down here on the ground the reason is is because one thing that we don't do is we don't deal with fertilizing this plant properly. If you want to increase the growth and multipl multiplication of, of different species of grass, you have to feed not just the plant, but the, the microbes, the bacteria, the protozoa, the molds, the fungi, everything that's associated with this. The problem is, is nobody feeds the bacteria the soil. We put some minerals on and it helps, it helps that grass plant, but it doesn't feed the bacteria. So now we're starting to see people put some milk on, that'll help feed them. We see people using fish solubles. Uh, the Indians did that for hundreds of years. Uh, we see molasses put on. Those things are starting to feed the bacteria in the soil. But you don't put on very much. Now. Uh, an example of, uh, of nitrogen, which I haven't talked about yet. The air is 78% nitrogen, but it has to be fixed or attached to something to be taken up by the plant. Usually it's in the form of a nitrate, it's NO3, and it's transported up into the plant by potassium. That's why when you see people Feeding, uh, uh, feeding the plants a lot of potash or uh, potassium chloride or potassium oxide. That potassium is used to transport nitrate up into the plant. Now this isn't a protein yet, it's just a nitrate. So it can be a little bit dangerous to be eating if it gets up into the plant because if the nitrate comes up into the plant and there's not enough sunlight to make enough hydrogen or energy available to turn this into a sugar and then after that it converts the nitrate into a protein let me put up a protein here that's ammonia NH2 now I have an amino acid that's my amino acid there's a whole bunch of different kinds but the only difference between a protein and a carbohydrate is this thing right here. So if I want to make this, I want to change that nitrate into that, I have to have a whole bunch of carbon and hydrogen. That means I have to take that and break down the water and then I have my carbon and hydrogen and oxygen to make my sugar and then to make the protein. But if I don't have enough sunlight or I don't have enough water, that does not get done. Now, 
also, uh, we all use, we all are focused on using uh, legumes to fix nitrogen in the soil from rhizobia that are associated with that, that uh, alfalfa or clover plant. But there are other organisms in nature that are not associated with a, with a plant. One of, them, uh, one of them is called azotobacter. Azotobacter doesn't care about what plants are growing out there. <coughs> and if you can feed them, that's the problem, if you feed them, they will actually take nitrogen from the air and make all the nitrogen available to grass plants that you need. Now there's more than just azotobacter, there's three or four more that do that. But to do that, you have to feed that organism. So what do bacteria eat? Well, what does your cow eat? When you're feeding a cow, you have a ruminant animal that has a, a big fermentation vat full of a bunch of different bacteria and protozoa and other things. <clears throat> so what you need to do is feed the bacteria out here in the soil with the same food that you give the cow. Grass, hay, maybe corn, maybe corn silage. You could, you could use any of those, any plant material. But no, we come along and we have uh, mowers that just chop it off right here and, uh, and then we leave a little stick sticking up. And we make 47 cuts so there's nothing left at the end area. And after we get done making all those cuts then we run the cows out there to chew it down to the, to the dirt. Well, what did you leave for the bacteria? There's another problem besides food for the bacteria. If you have open spaces here on the ground, the sunlight is antibacterial. And you will nuke them. You'll kill the bacteria because of, because of the uh, excess sunlight. Another thing that occurs is drying. You have nothing to trap the moisture. So if you knock some of this plant material down on the ground, then you can trap some more moisture so this drought doesn't really be become a problem. You have a food source for organisms to grow and multiply and, and to, feed, uh, to feed the plants. Now the other thing, uh, another thing that you need to be involved in with this is, is uh, when you do knock some of these plants down with an animal, some of that material is going to come back up again and start growing and some of it will be knocked down here permanently especially if you had just had a rain and they knocked a lot of it down on the ground and the recovery if you've got a, a a small area that that you put the animals in for too long a period and it became kind of a mud hole and then you moved them on that area where you made it such a mud hole if a recovery period is long enough will be the best the best uh, tallest grass that you've ever seen but it takes some recovery period to to uh, to be able to grow it back so I don't worry about animals pugging something up or just stomping on it now uh, so we got this stuff knocked down another thing why you only want to eat the top third of the grass plant is now you have uh, this much grass plant, uh, some of them that are still growing, that haven't been knocked completely down on the ground, that's going to collect sunlight. If you only eat the top third, this grass plant that we ate to here, compared to one that we ate clear down there, or made hay off of, which one is going to grow back faster? Well, this one. Very obvious. So that means if I'm rotating animals around, I can come back to this grass plant and it will have recovered where this one's still down here. So what you end up doing is making more and more tons per acre. I used to believe that you could easily do uh, three times more tons of grass per acre, three times by doing this. And I found out I was wrong it's more like eight to 10 times. 
you've probably heard of Ian Mitchell Innes, which in 97 I went over there, and, and he used to have this, this tall native grass, probably 15 foot tall, and they would burn every year because it was so, uh, so lignified that the animals couldn't eat it. And, and so he, to get animal performance, he would, he would set a match to it. And I said, well, you know, if you keep it in a, a vegetative state, then you never have to worry about that. So you just rotate them around and eat the top third and then come back around again in your paddocks so that you only get the top third. But he says, I can't get around my whole property before this has already more than recovered, and so it gets too mature for me. So I told him, well, sell half your farm, then you can get around. And I didn't know that that was not something you said in South Africa, and so we didn't get along very well. And, uh, but I learned about three or four years later that he leased out two-thirds of his farm and started grazing this way and now has increased the animal numbers eight times over what he had before. Now that's like having buying eight more farms and he still only got one third of the acres. Now that's pretty amazing. I didn't know that was possible. But I think Greg's doing it and uh, Doc Kincaid's doing it and it works quite nicely. So. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of this. I've got some more drawings. All right. Now when we're feeding a cow, and a little later this afternoon, right after this one, I'm giving a talk over there about, uh, uh, about ration balancing. Uh, and I'll talk about carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But first, I'm going to, I'm kind of doing things a little backwards. Here's my room. And, and if I have a diet on a cow that's high in energy, and low in protein, I get a fat cow that doesn't give very much meat or milk. All right, if that's what you're hunting for is a lot of back fat, but remember it takes two and a fourth times more energy to put on a pound of fat than it does a pound of meat. So it's very inefficient to put an animal in a feedlot situation on a high grain ration and 10 or 12% protein, and it costs a huge amount of money. So. Let's look at what happens then if you have protein in excess of energy on a diet. We're putting them out on this lush green pasture, maybe some wheat pasture. All right, first off, we have to remember my, my carbohydrate here. And I know many of you have already taken chemistry a bunch, but a lot of the people I deal with uh, have only eighth grade education, so uh, making something exact just doesn't help. So here's my carboxylic group, which they don't care about. And here's my amine group, which they don't care about. Now what happens in the rumen if I have too much protein? And this is why I want to graze the top third, because it has less protein and more energy. If I have a, pr a protein excess diet, the bacteria are the ones that make the determination. The cow, the cow doesn't have a choice. So what they will do is they will deaminize that protein. In other words, they take a bite and they spit that ammonia out. So here it is. And ammonia is a gas. Can you think of what happens if you get a whole bunch of this gas in here? How about if we have an oily substance because we're on clover or alfalfa and oils float on top of water and traps the gas. Those are called saponins 
traps the gas, so there you get your frothy bloat, okay? Now you can use an anti-foaming agent to cut that surface tension. You could use vinegar, uh, an acetic acid that'll make an ammonium sulfate or a ammonium acetate, which is a neutral salt. So if you get an animal with bloat, get a quart of vinegar and drench them. That's a quick way to take care of the problem. If you, unless you have an anti-foaming agent on hand. All right, now, another problem with that ammonia, that's the bloodstream, by the way. You notice I'm very good with my physiology and I have all the right things. You notice uh, right in behind this rumen, just so you know, I know there's some more stomachs, okay? But I'm not interested in them right now. Oh, one, one thing more. Ammonia is an alkaline substance. So if we're trying to keep fermentation proper, we'd like to have a pH somewhere around 6, 5 to 7. Yes, it gets more acid with fermentation because the bacteria use an organic acid to digest things. They don't have teeth. But the more acid you make it, the more closer to acidosis you get. Also, if you give too much protein, more alkalosis conditions, and you will depress the growth and multiplication of bacteria, okay? So what happens is this ammonia, which is a gas, and the room and walls gas permeable, this ammonia is gonna go right in and jump right into the bloodstream. And to transport it, it will be transported by the red blood cell, which we call met hemoglobin now. Uh, your doctor checks you for bun or blood urea nitrogen level. Okay, that's one way to, you could determine it. You could do the same thing on a cow. All right, now the problem is those are lungs. Uh, they look like lungs, don't they? Okay, and the bloodstream's going up here. Yeah, it goes through some other things. We'll get to them here in a minute. But the purpose of the, of the lungs is to transfer oxygen in and carbon dioxide, which is a waste material, out of the cell. So we got all this ammonia in here. Now we can't pick up carbon dioxide because the hemoglobin has been attached with a with an amine group or with ammonia and we can't get oxygen into the cell into the bloodstream because we got too much ammonia now what that means is you have cows in the summer on this lush green pasture standing under a tree going <sighs> and you guys say it's because it's too hot maybe not Maybe it hasn't got a dang thing to do with the heat. Oh, well, it does a little bit, because if you know your gas laws, when you have higher temperature, the oxygen molecules are farther apart. Okay, that is a problem. But I've seen it happen when it's only 60 or 70 degrees out there. So I don't want to hear about heat. I know what it is. Now you can, here's a way to test this. Uh, you can test uh, uh, the blood urea nitrogen level. Another way you could do it is uh, this bloodstream is going to go through the liver and the kidneys, and it's going to flush some of this ammonia out, depending on how much you're feeding that cow as to how much you will end up with. But now you can have urine urea nitrogen. You can actually check the pH of the urine of the animal, and if the pH is 7, everything's pretty good. But if it's eight or nine, then that means that you're filling this system with ammonia and those cows are gonna stand over there under that tree, breathing really hard and salivating and, and, they, and their performance will be terrible. All right, <clears throat> so this is a way to check it. When the pH reaches nine in that urine, you're not gonna get a cow bread. I, I don't care what you do. 
You're just not going to get a cow bread. A lot of people will blame it on the heat again. Now, heat does cause a problem when it's hot enough, but at 70 degrees? So if you've got a breeding problem, part of it may be, may be an excess of protein. And you can just check the pH. Just get you some pH paper that go, runs from 4 to 9, and just dip it. Don't dip it on the soil, because the soil will give you an incorrect pH rating, but on a blade of grass or on a rock. Or if your kid's fast enough, give them a cup. I don't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they have to be pretty fast. But if they're like my cows, you'll be standing out there for days waiting for one to urinate. And then you get in the truck, and then they do it. That's how it works. Uh, it's, it's, they're just excellent at that. The problem with the liver and the kidneys, why it doesn't flush it all out, is it's only capable of flushing so much. You ever seen a filler that didn't plug up? No such thing. They all plug up. This doesn't really plug up. It just can't get rid of the, uh, the volume of nitrogen that can be available to the animal. All right. Now I'm going to... Put down here the uh, this is the intestinal tract the last three feet before it falls out of the ground called manure that's where a lot of it a lot of the fatty acids the amino acids and the vitamins and everything gets absorbed into the bloodstream only trouble is if we have too much ammonia the blood urea nitrogen level is too high then we're going to inhibit some of the uptake that's where the problem with breeding comes in. You've got a protein excess, you can't absorb phosphorus. It's just not going to happen. But nobody associates protein excess with being a problem. But it is a huge problem. So you inhibit some of the uptake. Another place that you can check it, if you are a dairyman, you can check the milk urea nitrogen level. All right, so that's probably a bad Wisconsin cow. Since I'm from Wisconsin, I can say that. I think I know some guys that have that cow. Anyway, you can check the milk urea nitrogen level. If I could spell it right. We want the milk urea nitrogen level to be somewhere between 9 to 12 milligrams per deciliter. If you get... Yeah, you can survive if it's 14 or 15, but once it gets above that, then what, what happens is the cow starts getting thin and thin, and she won't breed back. Happens a lot. But that's when they're trying to get this cow to peak very well, so they feed a huge amount of protein, and uh, they, they give 150 pounds of milk a day, but then they drop like a rock. And it's because the liver and the kidneys finally couldn't take it anymore, and so they shut down, and so the production drops. I'll give you an, another example of that for beef people. Wheat pasture cattle. Wheat pasture cattle, they take these three, 400-pound calves, and they, and they put them out on this lush wheat that's probably this tall. If you test the whole plant, it runs about 24% protein. Okay, and, and if it was a little more lush or if you got crazy with the fertilizer or with putting a lot of manure on it, it can be a lot higher than that. And sometimes the, 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 it's not a true protein, it's actually a nitrate. That's when you see cows on their back doing push-ups. No, wait a minute, it's the other way. Well, they're dead, okay? So, so, uh, uh, so you don't want a, a huge nitrate problem. All right, so we have this protein acid. You put these cattle out there, and they put them out there on this wheat pasture for 100 days, okay? And the national average, according to whoever does all that uh, calculating, says that the cow, the, 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 that 100-day period, the national average uh, will, uh, uh, gain will be 1.9 pounds a day. That's just automatic. You put them on wheat pasture, that's what they gain. If you take those calves off at 50 days and weigh them, you will see that they have been gaining anywhere from five to six pounds a day for the first 50 days. 
okay? I, I, it's been, I've done it a bunch of times. Five to six pounds a day, every day for 50 days. So the question is, oh, by the way, they call it compensatory gain, okay? It's just not real. Uh, so if that's true, then what did they have to gain the last 50 days to end up 1.9? They had to lose weight. I call that compensatory loss. In other words, so what should you do? What you should do is take the calves in there, put them in there for 50 days, sell them, get another bunch, and do it again. I actually have people that do this now. Well, I don't know them. I just know that they've, they've done it, wrote me back, and said, well, we, that's what we're doing. Now, could you extend that rate again at four or five pounds a day longer than 50 days? Yes, you could. But what you would have to do is you would have to lower the protein of the diet and replace that energy with, some, with an energy source. Okay, and you could extend it. But that's a greater cost. So is it cost effective? I don't know. You guys will have to figure that out. But I do know that if you just want to make a quick turnaround, bring them in for 50 days and sell them and get another 50. Okay? Uh, all right. I lost my, yeah. Yeah, the, the reason they don't gain anything in the last 50 days is because the liver and the kidneys can't flush out the ammonia. And so... You're blocking intake of food, fatty acids and other amino acids and vitamins and everything, and so the rate of gain will drop. That's why dairymen uh, feed a high-protein diet to push the cow to a higher peak, and then when they, <coughs> what they'll do is they'll get up there maybe 150 pounds of cow a day, and then they drop, and then they lower the, the, the extra protein that they give the cow. They drop the, they drop the extra feed because now they can no longer afford it. Then what happens? Then the cow comes with the second peak. It's not as high as the first, but she comes up in milk production. All right, so they raise the protein extra that they give the cow. Then what does the cow do? She drops down in milk. When are you going to figure it out? Duh. Every time I feed extra protein, the cow comes down in milk. It's because the bacteria in the rumen don't care about you guys. And what they care about is energy to grow and multiply. So they'll use protein for an energy source. So if you're feeding soybean meal to an animal out on pasture, how dumb is that? Check the pH of the urine and see if they need that protein. Then ask yourself, when it's a pH of 8 or 9, are those bacteria using that protein for a source of energy? Probably. So you could save a lot of money. Now, the, yeah. Of course. You could, it could help. Uh, if you, it, the problem is, is you've got to remember the natural instinct of an animal. The natural instinct of an animal is to live from today until tomorrow. And the only thing it requires for that extra energy, uh, 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 extra energy is, is they produce fat to live. They don't have to have protein. They don't have to have vitamins and minerals. They just have to have energy to live from today and tomorrow. That's what the deer and the bear and everything does, puts on a bunch of back fat. So if I, if I have a bunch of animals out here on lush green spring grass that's anywhere from, if you've got clovers or alfalfa with it or some of these others, it might be as high as 37% protein. If I have them on that and I put out some, let's say, straw or mature grass hay to dilute that protein down, they're not going to eat very much of it. The reason is is because the energy in the green grass is higher than it is in the mature grass, so why would you want to eat it? But they will eat some, and it will help dilute down. 
The other thing is, is if you eat the top third of the plant, instead of the whole plant being 24% protein, that top third might be 16. But it'll be higher in energy. If you watch the animal graze, you turn them out there, and, if, and rather than running away real quick and watch them, they don't stand in one place and eat the grass all the way down. They never do that. They just eat the top third. They just take a bite, and then they move on. The only time they'll eat more is if you leave them in there for a long period of time, and then they will come back and attack that plant again. And every time they do that, the energy is going down and the protein is going up. So you need to rotate them animals and keep them off that. Now, there'll be some grass plants that they won't eat at all. Some of it may be because there was some manure there before, so the nitrate levels are high, or the potassium levels are high, something is high, something that they don't like. So if you, so don't worry about those grass plants that they don't eat. Don't worry about if one of them is a thistle. Don't, don't worry about those, Th those are fertilizer. Those feed those bacteria down here in the soil to make more nitrogen or fix more nitrogen and also make some of that rock fertilizer that you have down there uh, in the form of calcium carbonate or other minerals in the soil that are not available. They'll use that organic acids will then help dissolve some of those and make those elements available. So you don't have to go to the store and buy so much lime or, or potash or whatever. So <clears throat> you can eliminate a lot of your fertilization programs, uh, whether you want to or not, by the way you graze. So uh, sometimes I forget where I'm at. Yeah. That's a great idea, because, because that's what they'll go to first. They'll eat that, and you, you help dilute down the protein. But, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think, of, think about this stuff very much. What about before you give them their uh, next break of grass, you feed some dry hay then? Because the high energy grass that they ate is already gone, then they're more likely to eat the grass hay that's not quite as high in energy as the grass, but higher, it might be a little bit, uh, uh, it won't be as high as that first third, but it might be as good as the second. And, and then you help dilute uh, that protein. It seems kind of silly to be feeding some hay on green grass, but I'm not talking about feeding a lot of green, a lot of hay, I'm talking about a pound or two. Okay, yes. Yeah, you could increase your speed of rotation, that's true. Uh, it, it, <clears throat> rather than putting them in there uh, in this one section for, for uh, one day, maybe you put them in there for six hours. Or maybe you make the, the area larger. But if you make the area larger, then you don't get as much animal impact to knock this grass down to help feed the bacteria and the worms and everything that's involved in the soil. And, and you, need to, you need to have that grass on the ground because bacteria don't have any legs and they don't jump up there and eat it. It has to be knocked on the ground for them to eat. Same thing with the worms. They get out in the sunlight and they're history. So it, it's a good idea to have that knock as much down on the ground as you can possibly get. Uh, this year was a really good year to find out if somebody was grazing properly. If you were management intensive grazing and you're grazing it down to this short, come about the middle of Ju June, you didn't have any grass. You didn't have nothing. All you had is dirt. Okay? Everybody in my country, we had a bad, bad, bad drought. We had a half inch of rain in May, and then we didn't have any, any moisture, any rain till the end of July. None. If you got management intensive grazing or set stock grazing, I don't care, and you ended up with grass like that in June, you weren't going to be feeding hay. 
real quick. All right, and haze free, right? Oh yeah. CRP in my country is $140 a ton, full of iron, weed, and thistle, and crap. The cows will only eat it if they're starving. I grazed, not properly, but I grazed rotating, eating the top third, and knocking stuff down. I'm not there a lot, so I can't do it properly. I never fed any hay at all. I had grass. I still have grass. I'm feeding some corn stalks now, and I'll tell you the reason why I'm feeding some corn stalks. I put out a bale for about a week, and it's only about, uh, about 40 head. The reason I'm doing that is because we've started getting rain. So now I got a bunch of lush green grass. And the days are getting shorter, so the energy's lower, but the nitrogen's there, and the cows are getting loose. And I needed something to dilute that protein excess down. So I put out corn stalks, and they'll go over there and just tear them things up. And the manure doesn't get so, and it'll extend my grazing. So I don't have to worry about, uh, about feeding hay until I get over a foot of snow, which I'll eventually probably get. Last year, I didn't. We could have grazed all year last year and never fed a bale of hay. It was really nice. But uh, well, that doesn't happen all the time. So, okay, you had a question. Oh. On, on stalker cattle on that wheat pasture, he was talking about putting out that uh, bale of hay or bale of straw to dilute that protein down. That's, that's exactly what they should do. Uh, they could increase the energy of that straw so that they ate more by putting maybe some molasses on it or, uh, uh, you know, uh, and that'll help dilute the protein. It'll entice them to eat a little more. But it's, there's, there's an expense in that. So if I put out uh, mature grass hay, some Bermuda grass hay from down that country in Texas or in the south, <coughs> if I put that grass hay out there, they're going to eat maybe 10% of, of their diet in mature grass hay, and that'll extend that 50-day period probably another 10 days just by doing that. So now you can get four or five pounds a day by putting out that Bermuda grass or mature grass hay. That'll extend it another ten, 10 days. And uh, they're not going to eat that much hay, uh, probably 20 or 30 cents worth. But for another five pounds a day gain for another 10 days, it's well worth it to do it. So <clears throat> you kind of have to worry. You know, most people don't do it, but you have to worry about the excesses more than you do the deficiencies. And, and one of the worst deficiencies for grazers is protein. The next most deficient, or the, I'm sorry, excessive element will be potassium. Because remember, potassium transports nitrogen up into the plant. And if you look at the cell of the body, whether it's yours or whether it's a cow's, it doesn't matter. Potassium controls the osmotic pressure inside of a cell. And sodium controls the osmotic pressure outside of the cell. All right. If you have a diet that's high in potassium, I've seen some of these grasses and pastures and hays run anywhere from 2.5 to 4% potassium. The requirement of the animal is 0.93% potassium. So you got anywhere from 2 to 4% excessive amount of potassium. The sodium content, the requirement is 0.24%. If you look at, at uh, an analysis of grass, the requirement is, uh, well, no, the requirement is 0.24, but what's in the grass is less than 0.24%. 0.1%. So it's almost non-existent. Okay. One of the ways you take care of that is with salt. 
okay? Salt is, of course, only one-third sodium and two-thirds chloride. So uh, you may end up with a chloride excess before you got rid of, uh, you know, bringing the sodium up high enough to counteract that potassium. Now what happens if you have that situation is now you can, the pressure gradient inside the cell is greater than outside, so you will get leaking of the cell, fluids out of the cell. Uh, in dairy cows, they call it utter edema. They start milking two weeks before, they, before they've even calved. In the high country, they call it brisket disease. I've even seen it in people with horses uh, that feed alfalfa hay. Don't ever feed alfalfa hay to a horse. It's a terrible thing to do to them. Too much protein, too much potassium. <clears throat> it's very, very hard on them. It's no wonder that they don't have uh, any triple crown winners anymore because they feed them all that nonsense and they got it all mixed. They got the ration terribly wrong. But what happens is now we're getting fluids leaking out because the pressure inside is greater than outside to hold it in but we still are able to get food in across that potential because of what they call the sodium potassium ATP pump. So uh, this ATP forces or pumps food into that cell because of the pressure being greater. But you get this leaking problem and you'll get, uh, you'll get uh, problems with swelling in the lower extremities uh, in the udder region. If you have dairy cows, uh, the big problem nowadays is what they call strawberry wart or hairy wart or foot abscesses, almost always in the back legs or the back feet where they get that. It's all caused by a, a potassium excess. All you have to do to counteract that is feed them some baking soda. Bring the sodium level up to counteract that excess of potassium or dilute the potassium and quit spending the money. Okay, so there's a, a couple ways you can deal with that. The, you know, all of this sort of thing also pertains to a grass plant. You know, for instance, in, in those grass plants, the, the, cell, the cell of the grass plant also makes what they call ATP, adenosine triphosphate, and, and the ATP is the energy in, in the cell to make more cells. So if you're short of ATP, you don't get performance, okay? Well, there's other elements that are involved also, but uh, uh, ATP is one of the main ones in the cell of the body and in the cell of the plant. So that means if I don't have enough phosphorus, I can't make much energy. So I, I never did understand why everybody focused on a high calcium fertilizers and they didn't bother with phosphorus. Now, I, we do a lot of analysis. We have a um, Elementar, it's a carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen analyzer. And hydrogen is what determines how much energy something really has. Uh, pure carbon supplies about 9,000 calories per gram but hydrogen supplies about 25,000 calories per gram. And pure carbon doesn't burn. That's what they have uh, called a diamond. All right, so it must be fixed or attached to hydrogen. So, so <clears throat> if you can increase the, the uh, hydrogen content of something, then, then more, of it's, uh, uh, more of the carbon is available to be burnt. Now, uh, so if I'm making AT some ATP in this in this plant, and I have to have this phosphorus, but I have too much calcium in the dot in the in the soil or in the even in the system of the animal, I'm going to prevent the uptake of phosphorus. So I I have a I have a problem with the way people fertilize a little bit because they have some terrible excesses, and which means you have to buy more products uh, to overcome those 
and also your energy in your plant material is lower. In the 1960s, the hydrogen content or energy content of corn used to be 7.1% hydrogen. This, this last year's corn and this year's corn, the hydrogen content is running 6.81. Now, it doesn't sound like a very big amount, but if you're talking about 25,000 calories per gram, that's a huge amount of calories we lost in this, in this corn crop that we're using. Now, what caused that? Genetics, I know, genetic modification, I don't know. I just, fertilization programs, I don't know. Something caused the energy to drop. Uh, uh, let's look at alfalfa hay. Alfalfa hay used to run 6.25% hydrogen. Now we're lucky to get it at 6% hydrogen. So we're doing something incorrect to get the energy up in these grass plants, or legumes, or seed heads, whether it's corn or whether it's, uh, you know, oats or whatever, because we're losing energy pretty fast.